In the second half of the 1800s, a spirit of innovation began to emerge, fueled by new and exciting discoveries in the fields of science and technology. But not everyone believed that the dreams of this new scientific age would ever come true. Some looked at the claims of how science will change our lives as nothing more than the latest pitch from a new generation of snake oil salesmen, selling the elixir of technology to cure the challenges of the physical world. Promising that someday men will fly across oceans, that we will ride in carriages that stroll down streets while the horses are left at home in the barn. The magic of lamps that could light up a room for hours on end and never would a flame be lit. These claims seemed like nothing more than fantastic dreams. Of course, there were those who believed that all of this and more was possible. No one in Medina embodied that spirit more than A.I. Root. Well, uh, he was born into a family of seven children right in the middle. And uh, he was the one that caught, uh, caught everything that came along, every sickness that came along, he got it. And he was a little runt uh, compared to his brothers, which were big and strong, like his father. And so his father realized that he wasn't going to be able to handle the heavy agricultural work. And so he assigned him to help his mother, Louisa. And uh, that was a good thing because she encouraged him to learn everything he could about his surroundings and uh, encouraged him to get educated. And he became an expert in electricity. But at the age of 17, he went out on the road to uh, educa educate people on what electricity was going to do in the future. And of course, his father said, you come home penniless. And so that would have just drowned any normal kid, you know. But he said, well, I'm going to show my father that I can do this. But for the most part, he was, he was successful in it. And it ended tragically. He had a, a boy by the name of Barnes who was 19 years old. He was 17. And uh, they were riding along after a heavy rain with a buggy and all their galvanic batteries and. Uh, and uh, everything that they used in their paraphernalia. And uh, the Barnes was having a good time splashing through the water. And uh, AI said, uh, you better be careful. That looks as if it's a washed out river bank uh, out there. And he didn't pay attention to him and kept going along. And, and sure enough, the buggy and the horse and everything went down into the water. And uh, AI struck out for the, for the shore, and he was just really no athlete at all, and he just barely made it with his clothes on. And he said he was sitting there on a bank with his heart beating so hard, and uh, Barnes was screaming he couldn't swim. And so um, he said, hang on to the horse. The horse might, might, should be able to make it. Well, the horse was just struggling and struggling and finally went under the water. And later on, my father was in, involved in electricity and radios. When the AM radio came in, it was a crystal set, you know, and you got to set the crystal just so. And, uh, and uh, then he had an uncle who was working with uh, uh, Westinghouse. And he, he uh, uh, was working with an amplifying tube. And so he gave one of them to my father. And my great-grandfather was almost stone deaf, but this amplified it enough so he could hear it. And he said, my stars. Uh, he was just really excited about it. And of course, he was also excited about electric windmills for generating electricity. He had an electric car. It was a Winton. And um, he, he generated electricity and charged the batteries. And uh, 
back in those days, the cars were so noisy, they scared the horses. And so the people would ask him what made his car go, and he'd say, the wind, and he'd drive off. <laughs> so quietly. But he'd take it to church, and he had this horn that he put in his ear so he could hear the minister. And uh, the boys around town found he didn't have any ignition switch. And so they could go in and turn the thing on and go around the public square with it. And then when the batteries were about dead, they'd bring it back to the church. <laughs> he'd come out and he'd say, I don't understand. I keep going to church and the batteries die. Uh, one of the one of the kids that did that, he was in his 90s. He came in from Arizona, and he said, I'm, "I have to admit, I was one of the kids that did that." <laughs> he paid a man fifty dollars to train him how to be a, a jeweler, and to be a jeweler in those days was an automatic rise in your prestige, like being a lawyer or a doctor or, or a minister, and so. Um, this helped him win uh, Sue's hand, which is the girl he was in love with. And her father was very strict about the fact that he didn't want her to spend, waste her time with him because he'd never be able to support a family. And so he came back and he already had three competitors here in town and that was tough to get their customers away. But he was, he was just worked so hard in order to satisfy his customers that that he went over a lot of the business and got an entry into the market. And uh, so his business was quite successful. Uh, and he, he, according to the Medina County Historical Book, uh, one year he used out about 3,000 pounds of precious metal, which he got at the Old Phoenix Bank. It was legal to melt down the currency then and make things out of it. He made silverware and watch chains, and, and I've got some pictures of his watch chains. Very unique design. One day while working at the jewelry store, Amos noticed the shop windows beginning to darken. As he walked closer, he realized it was a swarm of bees. Just by the very nature of this man, where others saw mere insects, AI saw a window into a fascinating world. He made a proposition to a worker, I'll give you a dollar if you can collect the bees and put them into this box, and all you have to do is capture the queen. Once the queen bee is contained, the swarm will follow. Like magic, the bees followed their royal highness into the box. Soon the task was completed, and upon delivery, the bill was paid in full. One whole dollar. A.I. Root was delighted with the treasure, but his wife Sue didn't share in his excitement. With a tone of displeasure, she scolded Amos. Amos Ives Root, have you lost all of your common sense? I can't believe that you wasted a whole dollar on a box of bugs. But just as a sculptor sees the statue of David where others see only rock, A.I. Root saw more into these fascinating creatures than mere insects. But how could he have ever seen what this simple act would mean for generations to come, for the Root family and for Medina. Well, he, he was constantly changing his, his interests, and he had the, the ability to change things and, and not necessarily be that sentimental about the things that he's leaving. The day after obtaining his bees, Amos Root took a long buggy ride to Cleveland to find books on the subjects of bees and beekeeping. It was then that he learned of a congregational minister from Philadelphia named Lorenzo Langstroth. 
Langstroth developed a method of making movable frames for hives so that the honey could be harvested without hurting the bees. Up to this point, the bees were killed in order to remove the honey from the combs. How this was achieved was built on a formula originally discovered by Aristotle. Aristotle found that if the bees were given a space of less than a quarter of an inch, that they would fill the space with a sticky tree resin called propolis. Given a space of more than three-eighths of an inch, the bees would build a honeycomb. But given a space between one quarter of an inch and three-eighths of an inch, the bees would leave that space empty. It was an understanding of how to use this space that Langstroth applied in the design of his frames. This allowed for the frames to be easily removed when harvesting the honey. This also gave the beekeeper the ability to inspect the hive for signs of disease, aging queens, parasites, or bees that were ready to swarm. AI saw great potential in this invention and learned that it had been five years since the book was published and still no beekeepers were using the hive. AI set to work. He followed the instructions and made the hive but found that the suggested lumber was too fragile, much like the wood of a violin. He made another version of the hive using standard lumber and found it to be sturdy enough to withstand use in an agricultural application. He began to manufacture the hive and paid Langstroth royalties for the rest of his life. Roots hives were a success. In the past, beekeepers could get up to five pounds of honey per year. Now, with the new hive, beekeepers could see yields of 50 to 70 pounds of honey per year. In the beginning of Root's fascination with bees, there was a lot of concern voiced by his friends that bees just didn't pay anymore. As in any new venture, there were the mistakes and corrections that are a part of the learning process. But when AI Root committed to an idea, he was willing to work night and day to see his idea realized. He built up his apiary to 20 stocks and in 1867 took the first thousand pounds of honey ever taken with an extractor of his own design. By 1869, the apiary grew to 48 colonies and yielded 6,162 pounds of honey. With this success, AI Root went from people advising him that bees didn't pay to people asking his advice on how they can get into beekeeping. As he considered his advice, Root felt that many of the products on the market were substandard and saw no other option but to manufacture his own improved versions of the tools of the trade. Eventually, the request for information became so overwhelming that AI Root thought it to be a good idea to produce a circular, advising what to buy and where to buy it. Here, he would advertise his company's products for sale, as well as take on paid advertisers. The American Bee Journal was out of print during the Civil War, and uh, they said that they didn't, people were not concentrating on bees anymore, and so that they just didn't see the point in continuing it. So the story that I get from my relatives is that he told them, uh, you, you bring this back into publication and I'll furnish enough articles to fill it for you. And so that was an advertising source. And then in 1873, he um, started his own magazine, which was called Gleanings in Bee Culture. And you see ads in there for factory-built homes and all kinds of things uh, not involved with beekeeping because it was an advertising media where they were, people were willing to buy. Gleanings in bee culture became very important to the beekeeping community. Through its pages, readers from across the country learned about new techniques and the latest innovations in beekeeping. In its earliest incarnations, 
on page one under the heading Gleanings in Bee Culture, there was a byline that read devoted exclusively to bees and honey. Since AI started his venture into publishing with the American Bee Journal, this was a logical starting point. The journal became an important vehicle for the upward growth of AI Root's bee supply business. But AI Root was a renaissance man who could never be limited to one point of interest. Eventually, the byline was changed to devoted to bees and honey and home interests. This seems to be where AI Root opened the door to let the journal expand the content to include science, religion, technology, humor, and philosophy. Gleanings had features for the ladies. This is where Mrs. Root took over the pen and offered her own touch to the journal. The idea that A.I. Root gave his wife a venue to address women's issues and concerns was evidence of progressive thinking for the time. There were commentaries on temperance, and A.I. Root took a strong stand against tobacco many years before the medical and scientific communities were willing to acknowledge the dangers of tobacco use. In this illustrated newspaper ad, there is an endorsement by Louis Pasteur and a caption that reads, Beech Nut, the Healthy Habit. Meanwhile, A.I. Root wrote a column trying to steer his readers away from tobacco. Root offered a program where anyone who would write in telling of how they gave up smoking would be rewarded with a free beehive smoker. There were gardening sections full of helpful hints for raising potatoes, onions, strawberries, and tomatoes. For the kids, the magazine had juvenile gleanings or boys and girls bee journal for children. The magazine covered a wide variety of subjects, but it wasn't at the expense of information on apiary related items. If anything, the bee information even became more expansive in its scope, with contributions by the foremost experts in the field. The free flow of information and the access for anyone from an expert to a child was an exceptional concept. What becomes obvious is that gleanings in bee culture started to take on the personality of its originator, A.I. Root saw something coming that he thought would revolutionize the way business could be done. While most businessmen feared the change, he saw potential and set the wheels in motion to meet the future head-on. The change that was coming was called rural free delivery. America was growing and according to the 1890 census, the U.S. population was at almost 63 million people. Of this number, 65% of the population was rural. While city dwellers enjoyed postal delivery service, the rural population had to come into town to pick up their mail at the local post office. Business owners were well aware of the need for the rural folks to come into town to collect their mail and they took full advantage of the influx of these potential customers. Businessmen feared that they would lose these customers with rural free delivery. But AI Root saw how gleanings in bee culture could benefit by the rural free delivery. Rural free delivery came along. He could see what that would mean to the average farmer. They could get all the merchandise and things that they needed, and he wanted to be on the leading edge of that, so he kind of gave, pushed the bee supply business over to one side, and he just was working night and day, which was the energy that he put into every new project that he came up with. And uh, he ruined his health, and he didn't eat well, and he didn't sleep enough, and so the doctor said that he was going to be a goner. And uh, he suggested to get out in the fresh air and get to exercise. So he bought himself a bicycle. 
The advice of A.I. Root's doctor coincided with a period in the late 1800s that ushered in the bicycle craze. Improvements in bicycle technology, such as chain-driven transmissions and pneumatic tires, made bicycle riding a much more pleasurable experience. Earlier attempts at the bicycle, such as the Velocipede, proved a challenging beast to tame. AI took a shot at the Velocipede when he saw it advertised in the Scientific American. He ordered the Velocipede from the magazine and it was shipped to him from France at a cost of over $100. After days and weeks of waiting for the machine, neither AI or anyone else had success in riding the heavy and awkward contraption. Root was laughed at and the story of a <laughs> fool and his money was spread around town with AI Root as the punchline of the joke. When he got it, everybody laughed at him because he couldn't get up on it, it was too small. And uh, so he took it up to the old Phoenix dance hall where he could get up on the stage and then get onto the bicycle and then he'd ride, ride the bicycle around. So once he got so he could do it well, then he, then he brought it out into the public and they were all anxious to get one of their own. After the Velocipede fell from favor, a more approachable bike that looked more like the bicycle we know today was invented. Wooden tires and bad roads made for hard riding. Now the rubber pneumatic tires made riding the bicycle a much more pleasurable experience. He was bicycling around and he would be riding back from Akron on the bicycle on the dirt road and there was a lot of dust that came up from the buggies. And uh, so he, he would pedal real hard to get around the, around the horse. And the buggy driver would see that he was going to go around him. So he wanted to, to not beat him. And so he would start encouraging the horse to go faster. And I said, I always won, though. With the new improved model, Riding bicycles became an activity that whole families would get involved with. AI Root's son, Ernest, followed in this trend and became an avid bicycle enthusiast like his father. The bicycle was known as the wheel. Soon, a feature called On the Wheel made its way onto the pages of Gleanings, where both AI and Ernest wrote about the virtues and adventures had while in pursuit of this favorite pastime. Some of the journeys by Ernest were truly monumental. Ernest documents riding his bicycle from Medina to as far away as Wisconsin and Illinois. These trips were made to visit apiaries along the way. This is a great example of how the bicycle craze made its way into American life. Meanwhile, two young men in Dayton, Ohio, were also caught up in the bicycle craze. They ran a bicycle repair, rental, and sales business, and like AI Root, also ran a printing operation. When the Wright brothers were in the experimental phases of the flying machine, AI Root wrote them, urging them to document their invention before others came along and laid claim to their hard work. Orville and Wilbur Wright were cautious and ignored the letters from this curious man. But after the seventh letter, the Wrights were convinced that AI wasn't trying to profit from their hard work, but that he truly wanted to help them secure proof and their rightful claim to their invention. Part of the Wright brothers' reluctance to advertise their progress was due to the fact that by the very nature of experimentation, there would be many failures before they could truly claim success. Root understood how cruel the jeers of the public could be while in the trial and error phases of a new pursuit. He shared his story with the Wright brothers of how while learning to ride the Velocipede, he became the laughing stock of the town. The Wright brothers didn't want the added pressure 
as they worked their way through the problems of the flying machine. Remember that at this point the idea of manned airship was considered laughable by some of the greatest minds in scientific academia. Finally, after many failures, the brothers had achieved a degree of success on the beaches of Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. While history celebrates their flight at Kitty Hawk as the watershed moment for aviation, to the Wright brothers, it was seen as a point in their process that exposed major problems with the aircraft. They realized that they hadn't achieved the ability to control and steer the craft. Each flight at Kitty Hawk ended in a chaotic, unintended landing. Also, the ability to turn the plane had to be mastered before they could claim to have invented a truly practical flying machine. The Wright brothers worked on their invention and extended an invitation for AI Root to observe a testing of their airplane at Huffman Prairie on September 20th, 1904. This was when AI Root had the pleasure of witnessing the flight of the first practical airplane. Inspired by what he had witnessed, Amos Root penned an article on behalf of the Wright brothers and sent it off to the Scientific American Journal. A.I. Root was frustrated when the magazine refused to publish the article. When Root explained the Scientific American's refusal to publish, the Wright suggested that A.I. publish the article in his own magazine. This is where Gleanings in Bee Culture was bestowed the honor of introducing to the world the first practical flight of an airplane. For the first time at Huffman Prairie, Root witnessed an aircraft that was able to turn in midair, could change altitudes, and safely land in the spot of the pilot's choosing. All aspects of flight that we today take for granted. <laughs>